Thank you all for being here for this particular edition of our Masterclass series. This one is Getting Your Insecure Passwords to Scram by our own Jonathan Katz and is being recorded to be used as part of the PGCon online conference series. Jonathan, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you very much for being here today. Okay, thank you. All right. Uh, welcome to Get Your Insecure Passwords to Scram, uh, part of PGCon 2020, the virtual event. Um, you know, I, I actually get this talk a few different names. You know, if we could also call it, who could actually, we can call it a tale of two hippos that also has an elephant with the guest star of Blue Elephant. And all will be revealed at some point, but these are our little helpers, helpers today that are going to help us uh, to, you know, learn what Scram is and how it works. Uh, briefly about me, uh, I'm the Vice President of Platform Engineering at Crunchy Data. Uh, before that, I had various engineering leadership positions and startups. Uh, all of them use Postgres. Uh, I've been using Postgres for about 15 years, maybe you know well for the past seven or eight years. Um, been a longtime Postgres community contributor. Uh, been involved in a lot of different advocacy and governance groups, uh, helping with content. Um, I have maybe a couple patches in the code base. You know, nothing that I'd write home about. One of them is actually related to Scram, uh, which is sort of how I got into the topic. Um, and I speak a lot at conferences, and now I guess I'm speaking at virtual conferences. So briefly about Crunchy Data, um, all we do is Postgres. Uh, all we do is open source Postgres. Um, we, uh, you know, we do a lot of stuff around uh, cloud-ready technologies, to use the buzzwords. You know, a lot with Kubernetes and a lot with security. Hence, you know, a Scram talk. So the go goal of this talk is, you know, to talk about it's really to, uh, you know exploration of password authentication methods in Postgres, and we're going to start by you know going over the evolution of how password management came to be in Postgres and the twist and turns it took. Then um you know we'll we'll see you know as we go through how Scram works, you're probably going to want to use it in production very quickly, and we'll conclude with you know how do you actually upgrade to it if you're you know already running an existing Postgres cluster. So let's log into Postgres. What happens when you log into Postgres? I mean, you typically you might do something like psql -h, you know, you, you know, you know, you log into your application, you, you know, you, you know, you have a particular username, you type in a password, you mistype it, you know, you don't log in. But then you type it incorrectly and voila, you log in. Everything works. It's great. Your data is secure or your data is at least protected from, you know, other people, you know, from logging in as you. But it just works. But what just works? You know, have you ever stopped to take the moment to think like, hey, what happens if I put in that password? Like, is it something, you know, is it going plain text over the wire? Is it transformed into like, you know, a picture of an airplane that then gets read by, you know, the Postgres authentication system? I mean, who knows? So how do passwords work in Postgres? It is very easy to take something for granted, you know, when it seems to just work. And the great thing about Postgres is a lot of things in it just do appear to work. Before version 10 of Postgres, there were two different methods for <coughs> storing and authenticating uh, with passwords. There was you know, the plain text method and the MD5 method. There was this method called crypt, um, which I'm just crossing out because it, it had not been supported since, you know, I think even when I started using Postgres. So as I mentioned, there's going to be some helpers that are going to help us explore these methods. Um, two of them are clients, which are represented by the hippos, and two of them are the servers, which are represented by the elephants, which I hope you know it all makes sense in this context. So let's, let's get a little bit background on the hippos. So meet Gray Hippo. Gray Hippo just loves using Postgres and loves storing large amounts of data. I mean, this you know, Gray Hippo is that prototypical Postgres user, the one that we know and love. Gray Hippo has the password of data lake. Wink, wink. Then there's Red Hippo. Red Hippo also loves Postgres, but Red Hippo is a little mischievous and you know tries to like pretend to be Gray Hippo and you know, you know tries to log in as Gray Hippo. So let's start with plain text passwords. It is stored in plain text. There's no encryption. There's no hashing. It's just if your password is password, then it's stored as password. It's also communicated in plain text. Um, this method was available while drivers were updating to the MD5 method, and which we'll explore in a few slides from this. It actually was completely dropped in Postgres 10. Though plain text, the plain text password method is completely dropped, there's still some uh, Postgres authentication methods that involve plain text passwords, including LDAP. So if you look closely at the protocol, this is still supported, but 
authenticating, which is the plain text password authentication method, is you know not even an option anymore in Postgres. So how does it work? So let's say Gray Hippo is like, hey, I want to authenticate. I'm Gray Hippo. Postgres comes back and says, great, tell me your password. Gray Hippo says, great, my password is Data Lake. Postgres says, great, that that matches what I have on file. You can access Postgres as Gray Hippo. And it works, right? <laughs> we, we authenticated our passwords. We know we know this doesn't work given the information I just gave about this not being supported at all. Let's say you know Red Hippo's just eavesdropping, and here's that Gray Hippo's password is Data Lake. Red Hippo comes to Postgres. Hey, I'm Gray Hippo. Wink, wink. Postgres is like, oh, cool, you are Gray Hippo. Just tell me your password. And Red Hippo's like, well, my password's Data Lake. Postgres is like, great, obviously you're a gray hippo. You know, you can access Postgres. Yeah, so it's you know, it's kind of it's kind of silly. <laughs> Fortunately, there are methods to avoid eavesdropping, uh, and you know, TLS is one of them. TLS is still codified as SSL in Postgres, but it you know it is using uh, you know transport layer security at this point. Um, and essentially what it does is it performs a, quote, secure handshake between two parties and encrypts all traffic between them, you know, provided that the secure handshake takes place. Um, in Postgres, the way you specify a connection occurs over TLS is using the host SSL authentication type in the PGHBA file. Um, and that requires you to have a TLS connection, particularly if you eliminate all the, the ones that say host. Um, and it can actually also be used as a method of authentication too. It's actually one of my favorite methods, uh, the certificate-based authentication method. That's a whole talk in itself. And actually, uh, at the previous PGCon, Stephen Frost gave a great talk on advanced authentication methods and covered certificate-based authentication in depth. He also covered Kerberos in depth as well, um, for those who are interested. Postgres 12, you know, a quick aside, Postgres 12 introduced a very cool feature. Uh, you can append client cert equals verify full uh, as part of your pghba.conf line. And the long story short is that this allows for a type of two-factor authentication um, where having a certificate is one, uh, one method of authentication and then you can use a password, you can use you know, something else. So combining this with Scram, by the way, is totally awesome and something you should do. So anyway, if you have TLS, then you, know, you can't eavesdrop anymore. You know, think of TLS as a wall or you know, it puts, you know, it puts uh, you know, gray hippo and the elephant in a tunnel where like you know red hippo can't hear. So red hippo's out of luck. Or or so we thought. So another method is, you know, let's say you know red hippo makes a totally normal request to gray hippo, like, hey, can you give me a dump of the entire database? I want to run some analytics locally, you know, uh, I, you know, the, I'm doing some data mining, there's something really interesting. Grape is like, great, PG dump all, you know, take the entire database. Red Hippo actually is doing some data mining. What PG dump all does is it gives you an exact logical copy of your database. So you basically can recreate it in another environment. And as part of that, um, you know, one thing you recreate are the user accounts. And as you recreate your user accounts, you recreate the passwords or the authentication credentials. So as you see here in, you know, perfectly plain text, um, we, you know, Red Hippo has ascertained Gray Hippo's password. But don't worry, you know, Red Hippo is very trustworthy. So as you can see, the you know the plain text method doesn't you know doesn't you know do anything really for us here. So maybe MD5 can do a little bit better. So MD5 password authentication, you know, it's not just how it's not just storing the password with an MD5 digest. It is an authentication method. There's a protocol to it. Um, the way it works is you take the MD5 hash of the plain text password and up append onto it the person's username. So if if my password is you know Postgres and my username is jcats, I would take the MD5 hash of Postgres jcats. You then prepend the string MD5 in front of it, and that's what's actually stored in uh, the Postgres user catalog. Um, this is communicated using the MD5 protocol, as I mentioned, uh, and you know, we'll see it in a moment, but basically what happens is Postgres uh, sends a nonce that's used, um, and you know, this is computational dance that is done. Uh, it's much better to visualize it with uh, the cute hippos than me trying to explain it. So let's log in using the MD5 method. So Gray Hippo's like, hey, what's up? I'm Gray Hippo, I wanna log in. Postgres is like, cool, all right, we're gonna use the MD5 method. Here's some random bytes, and here it's R4 and D. 
So what Grapo does is first Grapo computes the MD5 hash of the password, the Postgres style. So it's you know password plus which is data lake plus gray hippo, which is the username. Uh, take the MD5 hash, prepend MD5. Then uh, gray hippo takes that MD5 hash, appends the uh, R4ND to it, the you know the four byte random nonce, takes the MD5 hash of that, puts you know MD5 in front of it and you know computes that and that's exactly what gray hippo sends to postgres the reason why this is done this way is that postgres has the original md5 hash here already stored so it's basically able to verify you know in this way that oh you know this is a valid password because if you know anything changes you know if let's say uh gray hippo puts in uh, oasis instead of data like we won't get that exact md5 hash so, and, and that basically allows Postgres to be able to confirm that it's Gray Hippo. So, is Red Hippo out of luck? If Red Hippo is eavesdropping, you know, it's basically going to see the, you know, this computed value, the one of the, the MD5 hash of the MD5 hash and the random nonce. So, if, uh, if Red, if Red Hippo goes through that method, and you know gets a different nonce and you know tries to compute it. It's going to compute something totally wrong. And gray hippo, I'm sorry. And Postgres is going to say no, you're not gray hippo. You know clearly, you know you got the password wrong. So red hippo might be out of luck here. But what if red hippo does that method again? Like hey, you know I'm doing some data mining. You know can you give me a dump of the entire database? Gray hippo goes and does that. And if we inspect the file. You know, we see, you know, we see this MD5 hash, and this MD5 hash is technically the credential. This is the MD5 hash of the password, you know, the plain text password appended to, uh, with a username appended onto it. And that's all you need to be able to log in as a user in Postgres. So Red Hippo tries again, you know, you know, Postgres sends back a nonce. Red Hippo basically takes that hash, computes the nonce, and uh, hashes it again, prepends MD5 and is going to get a valid credential. Huh. So, you know, we seem to be out of luck. There's other, and even better, there's other ways that Red Hippo can get the password too. Um, if you create your passwords like this in, in Postgres, you know, create role with the password flag, it's in plain text, you actually could log to the server log. So if, you know, Red Hippo has access to it, uh, Red Hippo can get uh, the plain text password. Um, some better ways to do it are to use the backslash password flag in uh, PSQL. Um, this computes the, the password hash on the client side before transmitting it, similar to the method that's listed right below that. Um, because it's pre-computed, um, you know, you're not logging the plain text password to the server logs, but you potentially are logging the MD5 password to the server logs. And again, you can tweak your server logs things to make sure they don't get logged, but, you know, this is a way it can leak. Um, if someone has uh, pri you know, privileges to read from the PG auth ID table, they can also get the password that way. These password methods need to scram. It's time to do a little bit better. Fortunately, there is something that allows us to scram, and that's the salted challenge response authentication mechanism. Um, what's very nice about this is, you know, without reading through everything on this slide, the idea is that these are all standards. You know, the, you know, basically the Postgres community decided let's pick a standard methodology for doing dealing with password authentication. And Scram is very well rooted in standards, very well rooted in research. Um, technically, uh, Postgres uses RFC 7767, which is the basically says use Scram with the SHA-256 hashing algorithm. Um, and you know, it and it basically implemented it according to spec. For the most part, there's one exception to this, which involves uh, the SASL prep note mentioned later. In essence, what Scram does is that it allows two parties to verify that they both know a secret without ever exchanging the secret. Now think about that for a moment. We can basically verify two parties both know a secret without ever exchanging the secret. So, you know, a client, you know, Gray Hippo, you know, Postgres, well, let's start, let me start from this point. Postgres can verify that Gray Hippo knows the secret without Gray Hippo ever sending the secret, and vice versa. Gray Hippo can verify that Postgres knows the secret without ever exchanging it. And the first time I realized that this is exactly what it did, like my head exploded. I'm like, wow, this is so cool. And 
it, it's really this is a really powerful technique in so many ways. You know, so long as it's used properly. And you know, we'll go through all the different steps of it, but it certainly makes it it's a much safer way of do, doing uh, password-based authentication. So the first part of this process is we need to create a password to be able to use Scram. And in Postgres, this is uh, this we need to create something called a Scram verifier. Um, a Scram verifier is basically this defined structure that you see below. Um, it includes, you know, we'll go through each step, includes something called a digest, iteration, salt stored key, server key. And even in this form, an eavesdropper is unable to access the secret. Now, is it, you know, do you want someone to have your Scram verifier? I mean, you know, the, 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 point, of, the, the point of the matter is that it shouldn't matter if they have it or not. I mean, it's better for them to not have it because they could try brute forcing it. Or if you use like an obvious password like data lake, you know, maybe they'll be able to figure it out. But it makes it so much harder when it's in this method. And you know, part and part of you know part of dealing with password authentication is you want to make things hard enough where it's not worth it for someone to try to attempt to crack it. You also don't want to transmit them in a way where you make it very easy for them to do it as well. So let's build let's build this scram verifier, or I believe it might have been uh, changed to scram secret in a in a later release. So Postgres supports two digests. Well, really it's one digest. It's you know scramshot 256. Um, Postgres 11 introduced something called Scramshot 256 Plus, which is used for channel binding, which we'll talk about later. Um, the reason why the digest met, so even though Scramshot 256 is what you're going to see uniformly, um, the reason why it's set up that way is so that you know, later on maybe we introduce Scramshot 512, Scramshot you know, 1024, or I guess it would be Scramshot 3, you know, what, you know, what, whatever the newer methods are, or maybe some you know, kind of you know, hashing method we've never heard of yet. Iterations. So, so as part of Scram, um, you know, we use a password, a password-based key derivation type uh, method. I, I always get the acronym wrong, PBKDF2, or it's very similar to that, where basically we take a hash message uh, authentication code um, and, and repeatedly compute it, you know, a certain number of times. Um, this, the, the default in Postgres is 4,096. Um, you know, you can actually, what's nice is you can actually modify the Scram Fire and, you know, use your own number of iterations. You know, Postgres will respect that. Um, 4,096 should be enough, but hey, you know, if you want to, you know, go to 8, you know, 8,000, you know, 192 or, you know, whatever floats your boat, you can do that. Assault. You know, what's the password without assault? You know, some randomly generated value. Postgres defaults it to 16 bytes. You can make it as long as you want, as short as you want, as long as it's stored in the base 64 representation. So building a Scram secret, um, you know, so I know there's two other methods as part of the verifier, but first let's start building up the secret because this is, you know, those two things are used, um, are derived from the, you know, what we're going to do in this step. The first thing that Postgres does is that it SASL preps the password, which is a method of uh, normalizing a UTF-8 encoded string. Now, this is where Postgres deviates from the standard. Postgres supports multiple encodings. You know, UTF-8 is very popular for a lot of reasons, um, but um, there are, you know, people can store uh, data in Postgres or you know, text data in Postgres that's not UTF-8. So basically, if Postgres detects that uh, your password is an ASCII-based or it's not UTF-8 encoded, like it doesn't do SASL prep. If it, um, you know, if it is UTF-8 encoded string, it goes through it goes through these steps and I'm not, I'm not going to go through all of it. It's basically, it's normalizing the string. You know, it is what it is. Um, for, for our example, it's still data lake because it's all ASCII. Um, this was, for, for me, when I, when I was uh, working on implementing Scram in one of the, one of the drivers, this was the quote, most fun step. Um, but yeah. So first step is we normalize the password. Yay. Now we start out, in my opinion, we start having fun now. Uh, now we can generate the salted password. So what, what the Scram standard defines is that the first iteration for generating the salted password is using the formula outlined below. Basically, uh, we take an HMAC with uh, the SHA-256 digest. We have password is the signing key. So what happens with you know, when you're generating an HMAC is that you have a, you have a key, and then you have a message. Um, and this is this is how you uh, basically show that there's you know, cryptographic authenticity in your message, particularly when you're trying to verify something later on. 
so what happens is that um, the key, you know, the key is password for us. Um, and the message that's being signed is salt concatenated uh, with a 32 bit value with the final bit set to one. Uh, and we're good, and basically this value is stored as an aggregator. Um, so for the remaining iterations, what happens is that you know we take the HMAC with you know again with the SHA-256 digest um, password, which is in this case data lake, uh, is the key signing the message that's composed of the previous HMAC calculated from the previous iteration. And as we go along, we XOR this with the aggregator. So aggregator equals aggregator XOR HMAC. Um, Gray Hippo is doing this as we follow along below. Um, you probably will never need to worry about this, but you know part of this is exposing how Scram works. Um, so in this step, TLDR, we generate the salted password. It is a method that is part of the standard is considered a good method. So from here, we can build something called the stored key, which is that fourth element in the Scram verifier. The stored key is, you know, quite simply, I'm um, saying this tongue in cheek, it's the hash of, it's the SHA-256 hash of the client key stored in the base64 representation. What's the client key? The client key is an HMAC using the salted password as the key and client key as the message. So again, like, what, you know, what does that even mean? So I'll try making a diagram to explain this. And these are, the, these are the steps we've taken so far. So we've had our plain text password. Um, you know, we follow the pbkdf2 type function um, to calculate the salted hash password. And then from there, um, we basically take that salted hash password and we take another HMAC um, using client key as our, uh, the right, I want to make sure I get the right terminology. Uh, client key is used as the, you know, as the message that we are, we are um, creating the HMAC of. And from there, we just take a plain old SHA-256 hash to get something called the stored key. So what happens here? Because this is actually an important step that's going to you know, play out during the rest of Scram. We basically, instead of just you know, storing the salted hash password, first we take you know, a message authentication code of it, and then we take, you know, we take a hash of it. So basically, we've transformed the salted hash password you know, first into a value that says, Hey, you know, I can, you know, verify, you know, I can basically cryptographically verify the authenticity of this message. And then we stored it, you know, and then it's like, let's take that and then we're just gonna take another hash of it. So it's transformed in a way where, you know, from from an outsider's perspective, it's very hard to figure out what that original value is, but I've done it in such a way where I can, you know, be able to re reproducibly compute it. So I'm basically not transmitting it in a way where I'm revealing any of the original information. Quote unquote. Lastly, we need to build something in the server key. The server key is very similar to the client key, except server key is the message. So instead of you know you know instead of uh, having client key be the message, server key is the message, and this is the literal message. It's the string server key, and we send that over. So the reason why you never have to worry about this unless you're implementing a driver or you know you're you're bored on a Saturday and you just want to have fun, uh, you can use backslash password, which is going to compute this, um, you know, within PSQL. Um, there's also many of the Postgres drivers support it. Uh, libpq exposes a function that allows you to build your own Scram secret. Um, it makes it much easier. And again, this allows you to build it on the client side. So that way, even if it makes itself into the server logs, you're not exposing your plain text password, you're exposing the Scram verifier, which could be a lot, you know, a lot more difficult to crack. So this is my favorite way to send it over to the server because, because of course, I like to compute it manually. Um, we can let Red Hippo listen because we're basically saying it doesn't matter. You can hear it, you know, good luck. And here's the reason why. It's, you know, if you look at the identifying information sent, you know, the stored key is a hash of an HMAC using the computed salted password and client key. You know, that's, you know, that is, you know, hidden a lot of the information that we want to send. You know, you're not really going to get anything discernible from that. And the server key is an HMAC using the computed salted password and server key. And again, you're not going to get a lot of information out of that. So we didn't send the original secret in any recognizable form. Now, Red Hippo can still try to brute force the password, or if you use an obvious password like Data Lake, you know, maybe, you know, you know crack it that way. But with a high number of iterations and, and good password selection, you know, it makes it very hard. So, you know, maybe Red Hippo is a quantum computer and, you know, it doesn't really matter. But we'll assume that, uh, 
Red Hippo does not. So great, now we store the password. Well, that's part one of this. You know, now we need to actually do verification. So as I mentioned at the beginning, the goal of Scrum Authentication is for two parties to verify that each one knows the shared secret. Um, and you know, part of a good authentication method is preventing against replay attacks. And you know, one-time nonces are used you know, for the set, each session that's being authenticated. We're gonna let Red Hippo listen um, to save space on the slides and you'll see why uh, Red Hippo's you know, off, you know, off to uh, stage left listening. So let's authenticate. Gray Hippo is like, hey, I wanna authenticate on Gray Hippo. Postgres is like, great, uh, let's use the SASL method, which is really Scram at this point, and says like, here's some available methods. Um, and right now the server only has Scram SHA-256. So Gray Hippo is like, okay, cool. Uh, I'm gonna choose Scram SHA-256 and I'm gonna generate a random knots. And that's what Gray Hippo is sending back to Postgres. Postgres is like, great, well, you have your nonce. Well, I'm gonna have my nonce, I'm gonna append it to your nonce, and I sent you back this large nonce. And this is part of ensuring that we're, you know, this is gonna be used in a single session. Um, we want the nonce to be generated as, you know, you know, cryptographically randomly as possible. Um, but, you know, that is part of the process. So, you know, then um, Gray Hippo also sends the number of iterations used to compute the salted password, as well as sending the salt over. Uh, so that way, Grapo knows how to you know, do that first part, which is compute the generated salted password. Now, what Postgres asks is for Grapo to send a proof that uh, Grapo knows the password. And you know, this is going to be, be part of uh, the, that secure transmission to verify that each party knows uh, the credential. So this is the magic, generating that proof. So Grapo says, OK. So I think the password is data lake. Well, really, Grebo knows the password is data lake. So I'm going to compute the salted password using the SHA-256 hashing method, which is what was agreed upon at the beginning of the authentication. Um, I've been given this salt, so I'm going to presume this is you know, the correct salt. And I'm going to start applying you know, said method with this salt for you know, 4,096 iterations. This is just generating this, you know, this salted hash password from before. I'm just being told, you know, I'm being told like I need to compute it, you know, using, you know, this salt, this algorithm with this number of iterations. Anyway, um, as you as you memorize from the previous step, um, that in base64, the salted hash password is that giant value. So great, we have the generated salted hash password. Now recall that the client, now remember, we don't want to send that over because then we're revealing the credential. What we're gonna do is you know, we're going to create a proof to say like, hey, I know this credential. I'm going to prove to you that I know it. And recall that we have this thing called the client key. And the client key was taking that subdomain hash password and creating an HMAC with the literal message client key. And then recall the stored key is the SHA-256 of that client key. And recall that Postgres has the stored key literally stored. That's why it has that name. So this is going to be part of generating that client proof. So we know that we can derive the client key based upon that method before and the stored key. And by the way, if we're sending the stored key over directly, that's essentially, you know, in one in many ways, that's just, you know, kind of it's not revealing the credential, but it's not necessarily sending, you know, a, a rigorous proof. Um, what we're going to do instead is we create something called a client signature, which is basically takes the HMAC again using SHA-256 um, with the stored key and the message containing you know all those authorization headers you know the nonces and some other stuff that's involved. Um, the authentication method has some things uh, beyond just the nonce. Um, I was trying to put it in slide form and it just got too messy. Um, this is a part of the details of implementing the scram method so um, you're going to I'm going to ask you to trust the uh, variable I put there of authentication message. Um, and that we take the stored key, sign, you know, essentially uh, create the HMAC using the authentication message as the message, and we get this thing called a client signature. Why is this important? Because remember, we have the stored key already on the server side. So the server is able to recreate this. So the final step of this before I send it off to the server is to create something called the client proof. And the client proof uh, is generated by taking the XOR, 
of client key and the client signature. And we'll see why this is important in a moment. So when this is all done, uh, Grapa says, great, I'm sending you the proof that I know the password or I know the secret. It's this, um, it's this um, giant uh, Base64 string. And also, though, here's the nonce, so you remember that we're in the same session. So Postgres is like, great, well, I can compute the client signature because I know the stored key. So I can create the stored key by saying, you know, basically I unpack those, you know, I unpack the authentication messages. Um, and sorry, let me back up a second. So we can compute the client signature because Postgres knows the stored key and has the uh, authentication info. Recall that, you know, this is how you get that client signature. And then basically, you know, basically that gives us the client key because remember, we took the XOR of um, the, the client signature, the client key. So if I take that client proof and I XOR it against the client signature, which Postgres can calculate, Postgres gets the client key. And recall that the client key is just the SHA-256 of um, the stored key. So if I take that client key that Gray Hippo sent over, I take the SHA-256, I get the stored key. If those two things match, then Postgres can verify that Gray Hippo knows the password. And that's what's really powerful because you know, we didn't just have Gray Hippo send over you know, the stored key hash. Gray Hippo had to go through all you know, this proof step in order to get to that. However, at this point, you know, at this point, we still want to prove that Grapo knows the password because, you know, even though Grapo sent over all, you know, all this work, you know, can, could Grapo, you know, derive the similar steps? You know, it's one thing to say like, hey, I have the stored key, you know, I know, I know the authentication credential. We need to deliver proof. So what Postgres does is it creates something called a server signature, which is the HMAC of, you know, of the of that stored server key. So it looks similar to this. It's the server key with an H, you know, the HMAC and the message is the uh, authentication message. And we get this thing called the server signature. Recall that the server key is basically the, the generated hash password with server key as the HMAC. So that way, and so this is why this is important because if, you know, Grable could maybe attempt to fool Postgres and say like, hey, I know, you know, here's the, here's the stored key. You know, I can prove you that I know it, but it won't be able to prove that it knows the server key um, without um, without you know having that hash password. So, and likewise, you know, it, and likewise, you know, Postgres could. Well, we'll see in a second. I'm, I'm bouncing around too much. So, Postgres sends this thing called the server signature. And technically, at this point, by Postgres standards, Grapo is authenticated. But Grapo should also verify that Postgres knows the server. And this is, oh, sorry, that the server knows the password. And th this is what I was trying to, uh, what I was fumbling at before. Um, you know, it's easy enough for Postgres to say, hey, I know the password, it needs to prove it. And know that, you know, we're able to get that server key because it's similar, you know, we can basically derive that from the hash password. It's just one more level, it's one more HMAC that gets uh, handled. So, so again, so the server key is the HMAC of the generated salted password. Um, it's very easy for Grapo to generate that if it has the valid password. And you know, we and basically we can, you know, and basically we can verify you know the server signature because the server signature is the HMAC with the authentication message of the server key. And that's something that's not been shared during this communication. So if Grape was able to you know, come up with a server key and verify that the server signature that Postgres sent matches, then we know that Postgres knows the password. And here's the thing, and we never exchanged the secret. And that's what's really cool. The identifying credentials did not get exchanged. Here's what we did transmit. Anything, the things that were identifying were the stored key, um, you know, which is just the hash of the HMAC, compute salt to password and client key. A server key, which is just the HMAC uh, using the compute salt password and, you know, server key is the message. And a combined client server nonce that can only be used once for this session and, you know, which is tied into uh, the client proof that's sent. 
information about the sessions and the authorization headers. We didn't really send anything that was identifying. We basically sent a bunch of stuff that is, you know, cryptographic proofs. And this makes it very hard for Red Hippo to figure out what's going on. And that's what's so cool, that we basically, both parties were able to verify the secret without ever exchanging the secret. That's really, that's really, really powerful. Like, I can't emphasize that enough. So Red Hippo is stuck. We basically made it so, you know, I won't say it's impossible, but we made it very, very, very difficult for Red Hippo to try to pretend to be Gray Hippo. But what about a rogue server? You know, did we, did we, you know, accidentally introduce another method for, you know, maybe we don't have a rogue hippo anymore, but maybe there's a rogue elephant. So here's case number one. The surfer claims to know the secret. As I mentioned that, you know, after, after Postgres verifies that Gray Hippo knows the password, technically Gray Hippo is authenticated and Gray Hippo can begin communicating with the server. See, as you see, Postgres does basically come back and say, you're authenticated. Uh, but here's my server. It says, but here's my server signature. So the important thing is that the client needs to verify that the server knows the password, or because if it doesn't, it'd be like, here's all my secret information, and the rogue server can be like, okay, cool, thank you, yeah, like insert this data, cool, I'm gonna sell it, you know, I'm gonna go on a you know shopping binge for fruits and vegetables. So. Basically, this is, it's very important that you verify Postgres knows your password. That final step is important. Now, this is up to for the driver implementers to do this. Um, you will, unless you're implementing a driver, like that doesn't matter, but you should check that the driver you're using does do this step because if it basically just accepts like Postgres is, you know, said like, hey, you know, the password's valid, um, you know, that's, you know, that could be bad. Case number two, you know, I call the elephant in the middle attack. So recall that uh, we can use TLS to secure the connection between endpoints between the client and the server. And you know that you know that secure handshake basically says, all right, you're communicating, you're creating, you know, communicating, you know, over an encrypted channel. But how do we know that the server that sent, you know, sent that, uh, or basically the server that you handshaked with is the same instance that we originally connected to? Now there's a bunch of this that's already you know built into um, TLS if you're using certificates properly. If you're both using a trusted CA, you know this you know you should be generally protected. But um, what if you're using you know something that's kind of borked? So let's say you know you go through you know you're going through the scram handshake process, and you have a rogue server, and a rogue server gets in the middle and says. All right. Well, you know, you didn't, you know, you don't know who you originally you know had that handshake with. You didn't verify it, but here's, um, you know, here's a bunch of stuff that appears to be normal. But don't worry, you know, I'm in the middle. There's nothing weird going on here. What we want to do is we want to prevent this, and there's a method, you know, account for this actually in the Scram, uh, in the Scram RFC called channel binding. Channel binding was introduced in Postgres 11, and basically it ensures that the TLS handshake is still the same when the client server that are, you know, between the client server that are identifying each other. Um, there offers three different methods um, in the RFC. Uh, Postgres uses the TL TLS server endpoint method, which it uses a hash of the server certificate to bind the channels. Um, again, this is typically used in a case where you can't, you, you know, you, you haven't, you're going to, I don't know the proper way to say it. I don't want to say like an untrusted TLS environment, but you don't have TLS set up where, you have, you know, your, your trusted authorities in place. Um, that said, it can be very useful, you know, you know, you, you can definitely use it to have that, you know, extra level of knowing that I'm communicating with the party I believe I should be communicating with. What's cool is in Postgres 13, um, uh, the Postgres client can require the use of channel binding. So, you know, until Postgres 13, you can basically say like, hey, I want to connect using Scramshot 256 plus, Postgres could come back and say, well, I don't, you know, I don't have that. Here's Scramshot 256. The client would be like, well, okay. And you know, continue onward. Um, in Postgres 13, you could basically say, like, hey, whoa, that's a downgrade. You know, this is a potential downgrade attack. I want to get out of here. So uh, <clears throat> excuse me. So that, you know, that basically gives you a way to exit. So, you know, you know, and you know, looking at our our friend um Gray Hippo connecting to the regular Postgres server. Uh, Blue Hippo is unable to prove that you know it can validate the certificate that's being used. So 
uh, channel bindings able to keep Blue Hippo out. So hopefully at this point, I've convinced you in one way, shape, or form that it's time to upgrade to Scram, particularly if you're on at least Postgres 10 or above. And you know what's nice is in one more Postgres cycle, you know Postgres 10 will be, um, oh, sorry, two more cycles, Postgres 10 will be the oldest uh, Postgres version, which means everything you know that's supported will have Scram. But you really, you know, if you're on one of the newer versions, you really, and you're using a password-based authentication method, you really should upgrade to Scram. So how do you do it? First, make sure all of your applications can connect over it. Um, as of this presentation, or really as of the last time I checked, um, all the client drivers and libraries and connection poolers and all of those that are you know, distributed support Scram, uh, with the exception of the Swift driver. Um, I have not checked on that lately. I, you know, I will hope that it uh, has implemented it. Um, the first step is in your postgres.com file, you're gonna set password encryption to ScramSHA-256. And you, you know, through the astute observer, it says password encryption. We're not encryption, encrypting the password, we are hashing the password. That is a legacy uh, a configuration parameter. So you set that, and then you reload your Postgres uh, database. Um, you can keep MD5 as your authentication method in your pghba.com file. If Postgres detects that the user has uh, a scram verifier, even though the authentication method says MD5, it will attempt to make the connection over Scram. The reason why that's great is that you can allow all of your users and applications and whatnot to rehash their passwords, but still not break them if they're using the MD5 method. Um, when they do rehash their passwords, use backslash password or uh, build that Scram verifier on their own. You know, don't please don't log your plain text passwords. Once all of your users have rehashed their passwords, you can go back to the pghba.com file um, and switch your authentication method to ScramShot 256. And that's it. Um, I did write a blog entry on this uh, if you want to see it, you know, codified out, you know, in addition to the slides as well. Um, but, you know, it, it, is, it, it is fairly easy to do. Um, as I mentioned, you know, make sure your driver supports it before you cut everyone out. Um, uh, as I said, you know, at last I checked, pretty much every driver supports it. Um, but again, please double check. Don't break your applications. Of course, upgrade to the version of the driver that does support it. So, conclusion. So, you know, really, really the talk, you know, the genesis of this talk really was just trying to explore Scram and starting to ask questions. I started asking myself questions that, you know, this just works, but why does it work? And I think that's one of the great things about the Postgres community is that, you know, the tendency to ask these questions like, you know, this does work, but how does it work? Why does it work? And in general, like good engineering practice is, you know, you shouldn't necessarily just take things, you know, for granted. There are better ways to do things. And, you know, we've seen this happen, you know, you know, all over. Um, you know, beyond Postgres, Scram is a general purpose solution that if you're doing authentication applications or password-based authentication applications, you can implement this method. Yes, it involves a couple of round trips, but it's definitely a lot better than, you know, a lot of the other methods out there. And that's why, you know, you know Scram is, you know, a well-accepted standard and one of the reasons why Postgres, you know, chose to use Scram. Um, I have on GitHub, you know, an example of Postgres password creator and an example, I call it a poorly written Scram implementation of Postgres. Um, you know, the, you know, there's, you know, you can, you, you know, you can look at how Scam was implemented in your favorite driver. Um, most of them are very clear. It's, you know, you know, really straightforward. Even though some of the cryptography can feel like it gets a little hairy, like all these methods are well defined in the various crypto libraries that are out there. And, you know, take this opportunity to upgrade your passwords to Scram. I mean, really, there's really no excuse in my opinion. Um, if, you know, so long as you can upgrade your drivers. But I mean, it's a great method. Um, I, I really, you know, I, I'm a huge fan of it. This is why I like to like to do this talk. And if you're on Postgres 12 and or above, look into using client cert equals verify full um, in your pghba.com file because you basically get two-factor authentication. So, you know, one, you do need to, you know, have your, you know, your trusted CA set up, um, but, you know, set up, you know, your equivalent to certificate-based authentication, you know, add client cert equals verify full, uh, set up Scram, and like you have this awesome two-factor authentication system in Postgres. And with that, I conclude. Thank you so much for listening to this, um, and uh, upgrade to Scram. Thank you, Jonathan. <clears throat> what a great presentation, and thank you for going um, 
so basic on some of that stuff. I was able to follow all of it, which is not often the case. So thank you very much. Uh, yeah. Anybody have any questions for Jonathan about moving all of the passwords to Scram? Uh, any questions? Because it's going to be assumed everyone is going to do so after this presentation. So ask questions now if you have any. Jonathan, do you have any insight into why the um, trust the server check occurs after checking the client as opposed to before? Do you have any insight into why the trusted server check? Uh, sorry, sorry, say one more. Uh, Kiki, please give a specific example. I'm still unwinding after giving the presentation. <laughs> you were um, explaining that during the Scram authentication process, it authenticates that the client knows the password and then gives the opportunity for the client to verify that the server knows the password. Right. Um, at, at first instinct, that seems a reverse from making sure you trust the server before doing additional calculations. Do you have yeah. into why that order versus the other? Yeah. So um, I will I will give the preface that I was not involved in the uh, RFC that uh, planned this out. I believe it has to do with the, the order of operations because the client doesn't know, because the client basically says like, hey, I, I know the password. And at that point, it doesn't know how to compute the password. So the first step is that the server needs to give the client enough information to compute the password, which is in particular uh, the algorithm, or in this case, the di sorry, the, the digest, uh, the number of iterations, and uh, the salt. So without that, you know, there's essentially a non-starter. And, you know, chances are the client, you know, the client is not storing the salt or the number of iterations of the algorithm. The client is just like, hey, like, I know the password's data lake. So that's why, that, that's pretty much why the order occurs in that way, because the client starts, you know, starts the, the heavy computations at that point. Does that, does that answer your question? I think so. I, th I think what you're saying is that... Um the initial information is necessary for calculating the client proof, and then that content is later used to calculate the server proof. Yeah, so yeah, that, that... Really do it. you can't really do it the other way because you don't have all the parts. Yeah, yeah, that's correct. Thanks. Great. Does anyone else have any questions for Jonathan about passwords in Scram? I have one. Um, Jonathan, that step about verifying the server, um, you didn't mention that in the other in the other ones. Like MD5 doesn't have a step where the client checks the server. Um, is Scram the only one that has such a step right now? Yep. Well, for the password-based ones, yes. Um, for the other ones, so... The other one I can think of is the certificate-based method. Um, I'm, you know, I, I would defer to Stephen on Kerberos. I'm pretty sure Kerberos, like everyone's checking everyone at all times. Um, <laughs> I've tried, I've tried to follow Stephen's Kerberos as much as as best I can. Um, but certificate is one where that's available because the client can set uh, SSL mode uh, verify full, and that does full basically. It basically verifies that the server certificate is valid. Um, for the other password-based ones, it doesn't, you know, it's presumed that if, the, you know, and, and if you look at the MD5 one, it's basically, you know, you know, the, the client, is, I, it'd be, it would be difficult the way things are constructed for the client to verify that the server also knows the password. It, you know, it is taking it on faith, though, arguably, the server could send back the MD5 hash, um, you know, with the, the nonce and, like, or do some weird things, but... You know, you, you might accidentally leak information as well. So um, the short answer is yes, Scram is the only password-based one that does it. You can get it with certificate-based auth if you set your client parameters correctly. Um, and probably again, probably um, if Steven's on, you could chime in about GSS API. I'm pretty sure GSS API, everyone's checking everyone. Yes. OK. <laughs> I'd say that's interesting, because it almost sounds like two-factor that the client gets to check two factors of the server. Yeah. Yeah, which is pretty cool. And especially if you have, well, if you have, if you have, you know, you know proper you know, certificates set up, um, you don't need channel binding per se. But um, if you don't, you know, if you're in this, you know, untrusted TLS environment, you can use channel binding to basically say like, oh, hey, like, no, you really are connect, you know, this really is the server I believe I'm connecting to over TLS. All right, thank you, Jonathan. 
Does anyone else have any questions for Jonathan about his presentation? All right, hearing none. Thank you all for being here and participating. Jonathan, thank you for an excellent presentation. This concludes this master class and presentation for PGCon. Have a great afternoon, everyone. Hey, thank you. Goodbye. Now we're live on the Q&A session, the real cool. Q&A session. And Jonathan one. Katz is here, and I'm going to mute myself, and he's going to go through the questions raised on IRC. Thank you, Dan. Uh, very happy to be here. Good morning, afternoon, evening, and good night to everyone. Uh, very excited to be participating in uh, PGCon 2020. So uh, I see there were three questions. Um, so the first one is, if someone else does not get your, sorry, if someone else does get your scram verifier, can they potentially use it for a man in the middle attack? So the short answer is no. Uh, if you have a scram verifier, you cannot perform a man in the middle attack, but you know, the, the best attempt you can make is to do a brute force attack with some sort of password based attack. Um, and basically it would involve trying to, uh, you know, basically, you know, you would try to take a plain text password, use the hashing mechanism to put it into a, a generate a salted generated password, and then try to guess the, you know, the stored key and server key from there. Um, but I mean, really, what you're trying to do is, you know, you're, you're essentially doing the same thing as trying to brute force a crack, you know, any other password, but it's costly because of all of the cryptographic operations you have to um, handle. Um, you know, the, one of the reasons why Postgres uses, you know, SHA-256 is that it's more costly to compute that than a SHA-1, which is what the original Scram implementation recommended. And of course, as computers get faster, you can see us, you know, moving to maybe, you know, SHA-384, SHA-512, or, you know, maybe, you know, some Thing, you know, more advanced, you know, time will tell. Uh, the second question, is the password for stored key and server key the same user password or is there a separate server secret? So keep in mind that the stored key and the server key are not the user password. They are a hash based uh, message authentication code of the, you know, the salted generated password that's gone through the PKBDF2 uh, type uh, or P, sorry, PBKDF2 type um, algorithm. So these are different representations. Um, they're not the password. And that's that's the, really the beauty of Scram is that these are cryptographic representations of another cryptographic representation of the password. So it's been, you know, you know the way I think about it in my brain, it's been totally garbled up to that point. Um, you know, the, the other beauty of it is that the server key is, um, you know, is, is I'm sorry. Uh, the server key can be, you know, ultimately recreated if you have the, you know, uh, the cryptographic representation of the password. Um, much as that, you know, the stored key can, you know, you know, be done that if you're able to derive the client key. But the reason why you don't need a separate server secret is that you cryptographically, you know, you've basically done all this cryptographic munging to get to that point. Um, the next question is, is there a way to implement this with LDAP? So I would love to ask a follow-up question to that, which is, do you mean LDAP itself or you know, Postgres implementation with LDAP? And the way Postgres implementation of LDAP works is that you're actually sending a plain text password over to Postgres, which then relays it to an LDAP server that um, you know, and basically tries to verify against that. So because you need the plain text password to query the LDAP server from Postgres, you can't use Scram there. Now, other LDAP based servers, you know, such as Active Directory are actually using uh, GSS API or Kerberos, which is a whole different uh, authentication system. And uh, uh, my friend and colleague, Stephen Frost actually gave a great talk at PGCon 2019 explaining how that works in that setup, um, which, is, you know, which is the preferred way to go. Scram is great if you're doing something that's quote simple and password based. Uh, if you're looking at more, you know, enterprise authentication systems, I mean, sure, Scram could work. You, you know, would need some orchestration coordination around that. But you know, there's better systems in place for that, such as leveraging Postgres GSS API support or doing something with certificate-based authentication. Um, I refresh the questions real quick. I don't see any more. Um, anything else I can help with today? I think that's about it. Uh, someone just mentioned on IRC, we could store the Scram secret in LDAP. So if you store the Scram secret in LDAP, then you would need 
Well, it's st so here's where it gets interesting. So then you would need for Postgres to scram with LDAP, but that means you're still sending a plain text password over the wire to Postgres first in order to perform scram. Um, potentially, what you could do is, is I mean, it's still not great. Um, you could send over the generated, you know, the the generated salted password over the wire, and then you know start scamming from there. Though I'm still, you know, the, the the point of scam is you're not supposed to chance, you know, you're not, you know, transmitting any information beyond that. So the problem is you still need a plain text password as a starting point to scram, but you know you're basically hiding that secret from other people. So um, there's a there's a potential way to do that. Um, you know, perhaps this would be a great. Uh, you know, hallway chat to figure out if this is, you know, possible to do it in a secure way with Postgres. It reminds me of years ago when I um, developed uh, a race timing software and somehow you had to have the database password in the embedded piece of software because it was not configurable. It, it, was, it came with the database and you had to run the two together. And yeah. I just did some sort of hashing stuff on it and reversed it it wasn't it was just obscuring the password that's all but yeah yeah there I, could be a way to do it if you prepare i guess in this case with scram there could be a way to do it if you prepare um the client key in advance i'd have to i'd have to look back at it i'm a little there could be a way to do it with the ldap i'm not optimistic at this point but i could be convinced otherwise but again, you know, I would say at this point, you know, the recommended way to, you know, if you want to use something LDAP based is to um, leverage the GSS API functionality. I think that's the end of the questions, unless you have anything you want to say in summary or. Uh, in summary, uh, you should use Scram uh, and there's already a patch proposed for Postgres 14 to default it to be the uh, encryption method. Um, Many thanks to Peter Eisentrad for putting that together. Hopefully it is committed soon. Um, and you should definitely, you know, you should definitely consider upgrading if you're on a newer versions of Postgres. But yeah, thanks for listening. Thank you, Dan, for organizing. I know it's been quite an effort and uh, looking forward to seeing everyone in person sometime in the future. Okay, thank you very much, Jonathan. And we'll uh, move on to the next talk in just a little while. Goodbye. Cool. Thank you, Dan.